Drive. I'm so excited that we're going to be catching up with Kate Leeming. It's been an absolutely ages since we last spoke with Kate, which way back in 2016, where she shared more about her early years cycling across Africa, Australia and Russia. But she also shared more about her next challenge, Breaking the Cycle South Pole, which is going to be incredible to learn more about. So Kate, for people who haven't heard our first interview, I'd love for you just to give a brief overview and tell everybody just a little bit more about you? I discovered the joys of traveling by bike when I first went to Europe back in the early 90s and did about 15,000 kilometers through Europe as kind of my personal discovery and that's where I really discovered my passion which I really just love the way um, you're so connected with the people and the land and I love the idea of bringing a line on the map to life and I really feel it gives a great sense of place and a perspective of how the area fits together. With that I then organized a journey I'm the first woman to have cycled across the whole of Russia from St. Petersburg to Vladivostok in 1993, aiding the children affected by the Chernobyl disaster, which was 13,400 Ks. And then 10 years later, I did the Great Australian Cycle Expedition, which was 25,000 kilometres through my own country, which was about education for sustainable development. That was back in 2004 and five. So that was a nine and a half months, 25,000 kilometres, including 7,000 kilometres actually off-road on remote tracks including the canning stock route so i'm the first woman to have cycled the canning stock route which i did as part of that journey from there i did breaking the cycle in africa which is 22,000 kilometers the first ever bicycle crossing from the most westerly tip in senegal to the most easterly tip in somalia in a continuous line and that was exploring the causes and effects of extreme poverty so i wrote a book about australia called out there and back i wrote a book about africa called njinga and I also created a feature documentary, which won some awards in L.A., and that was also called Njinga. Since then, as you mentioned, I'm planning to cycle across Antarctica. And so the first thing I had to do was really upskill because I'm really pretty good at the heat and understanding what to do there. But the cold is totally foreign to me. So I, I did three polar training expeditions up in Svalbard in the far north of Norway. Then I did Greenland, northeast Greenland. So it's the first ever bike ride up in the far northeast of Greenland, and then in Arctic Canada over the Beaufort Sea, right up in the top of the Yukon and Northwest Territory. So that was incredible as well. So the bikes I've been using, I found a fellow in, in the US who had made mountain bikes that were all-wheel drive. So in other words, when the back wheel slips, the front wheel engages. So it helps, me, helps pull me out of kind of any time it's soft or really unstable conditions on the, on the road or going down steep hills. So I convinced Steve to make a fat bike, the best bike possible for Antarctica. Basically, he's made me four of these, one for each of the expeditions that I've done, testing them out, trying to get the widest tires possible and building the technology around it. So I'm sort of ready and kind of understand that. But the biggest issue is trying to find the kind of funding that I need to do that. It has to be done supported because there's absolutely no way I could carry what I need in those kind of conditions. It's just not feasible to do it successfully, I don't think. So that makes it pretty expensive. And so really that, that's what's holding me back there. So since 2018, uh, that's where I've kind of taken that and I'm still working on Antarctica, but I've also decided to set up a um, an education program called Breaking the Cycle Education. And what I'm doing is education for leadership and learning about this, the global goals and it sort of involves you know, geography and, and really helping kids to explore the world themselves to, to get the, the motivation to do that and to find their own passions. So that's kind of a little bit about the education program. But what I did also is I thought I'd do a preparatory expedition for Antarctica still, but one on each other continent. And that's what I'm, I've been doing over the last two years or two and a bit years. So those expeditions could either be polar or in sand or at altitude. And so in 2018, I did too many, actually. I sort of felt like I was trying to do them. And it's very difficult. You know, I've got to start from scratch each time in terms of, in terms of finding the funding, which is very, very it's the hardest thing. And then giving each expedition kind of enough attention, the attention that it, it needs. So uh, 2018, I did uh, down the Baja Divide in Mexico. Then I went straight on to Iceland and tested out fat bike number four. Then I did an incredible journey in Australia down the Fink River, which is uh, the world's supposed to be the world's oldest river, or part of it is. 
and it runs from the West McDonald Ranges, about starts about 130 kilometres west of Alice Springs, and it wriggles around through beautiful gorges, out through pastoral country, and ends up in the Simpson Desert, sort of, and then it goes underground, and eventually, if there was a massive flood, it would end up in Lake Eyre. So that's sort of the principal river through Central Australia. And so I, it was a two-week journey. I went from the, the start, from where the two Davenport Creek and Ormiston Creek meet. And we found the, the sort of GPS point there. And basically, it's, we're not talking roads. We're talking just on the – if it's an ephemeral river. So there's there's pools every so often. And then it's just sand. And, and the first bit through the gorge is just rocks. So I'm just cycling – using fat bike number two that's just been to Greenland down the middle of Australia. So that was in- incredibly interesting. The next one I did in 2018 was in Ladakh, uh, back in the Indian Himalaya. And there was I can tell you a whole lot about that too. That was designing a new route for world expeditions and did a great humanitarian mission there to help uh, work with a company, an organisation to electrify the, m- the most remote village uh, in the Lazansko region there. So that was 2018. The last two expeditions, I'm trying to make a little bit more of them. So last year, I made the first ever bicycle journey down Namibia's entire coast. So starting from the mouth of the Kinane River on the Angolan border and finishing at the mouth of the Orange River on the South African border. So it's just over 1,600 kilometers, of which 800 was just absolutely no roads. It's just sand, you know, going through the Namib Desert all along the beach. Amazing. So that was an incredible journey and of which we're making a film for. Um, tomorrow I'm starting on the final expedition of the series, which is called, I'm calling it the Andes, the Altiplano and the Atacama. So it's going to be at three and a half thousand kilometres starting, I'm in Cusco right now. I've designed a really incredible route that ends up at Oyas del Salado, which is the world's highest volcano um, and the second highest uh, mountain outside of uh, the Himalayas. That's in the Atacama. So it's um, getting quite excited now. That's, a, that's about a quick rundown of where we're at. <laughs> I mean, that is a huge amount of expeditions and adventures and challenges that you've been on. Absolutely amazing. And we are going to have to obviously go into the detail on some of those a little bit more because they sound so amazing. What happened in 2017? What were you doing in 2017? Myself and Claudio von Planter flew into Whitehorse. Basically, we drove up to Fort McPherson, right up in the north, and then basically did a route. Sort of, some of it was following ice roads, and some of it then, like I followed the most westerly channel of the mouth of the Mackenzie River, which is absolutely frozen over, all the way out along these channels. So it was the Peel Channel, the Moose Inlet, Moose Channel, all the way out and onto the, over the Beaufort Sea to a place called Shingle Point. So normally, for the locals, it's about a five-hour boat journey in the summer from a, a town called Aklavik out to where I was and they go out there fishing and hunting basically but yeah it was pretty surreal going out there on a on fat bike number three <laughs> in 2017 I really wanted to get experience in the proper cold and I think I did <laughs> Good, you know really did get it so sort of around about the minus 20 mark most of the time so that was a, a test and you know still trying to get my clothing systems right and it's very difficult because, you know, obviously living in Australia, I just don't have any access to those skills really. So you sort of learn pretty quickly. But I was learning from the guide as well. But he's not used to cycling in those conditions. So the clothing that he would wear is quite different to what I would wear. So I was trying to sort of understand the principles and try to take a bit of, and learn what I can but still be able to move uh, freely. So there was a lot lot learned out there. 2018 was an incredibly busy year for you with all of these different expeditions um you know for, from Baja in in Mexico to the Skeleton Coast in Nambia to over in India and in Australia and I'd love to know more about the planning and the preparation I mean how long have you been planning these these challenges adventures in advance is it something that are you, are you quite structured is it a case of right this month I'm there that month I'm there how do you fit it in with everything else that you're doing uh, with a lot of difficulty. <laughs> um, so the planning bit, I mean, each of those journeys, like they're not pulled out of thin air. I haven't, they're kind of things I've thought about in the past for different reasons. Or, for example, with the Skeleton Coast, I'd cycled through Africa and I got down as far as northern Namibia. But I'd also heard about Benedict Allen's journey where he walked the length of the Skeleton Coast in 1995. And I kind of remembered that. It kind of 
thought, wow, that's an incredible place. And and when I came to thinking about designing uh, an expedition on each continent, you know, the sand is what being one of them. I, it just it was just obvious to me. <laughs> so I have to work in between all of this, and, and so guaranteeing that I could do that and do it safely and all that sort of thing. Um, I was intrigued by that area. Uh, I've been to Ladakh, for example, twice before. But I also had a connection with an Indian company called Global Himalayan Expeditions, and they have been bit by bit electrifying all the remote villages with solar power. So they, they do this incredible – it's kind of sustainable tourism. So there's a group of up to 20 people, and basically you do a, an adventure trek out there and then do the wiring up. They have their own electricians, of course, and then back. But also I did that in the middle of my cycling journey. So I actually cycled – 650 kilometers out there and I timed it to join the group did the trek and back then we came back to Leh and then I did another the other half of the journey over some of the highest passes the Fink River I thought thought of years and years ago but it wasn't possible because fat bikes weren't invented I thought about that during my Great Australian Cycle Expedition when myself and my friend Greg Yeoman actually camped on the Fink River bed where it crosses the Stewart Highway it's about 120 kilometres south of Alice Springs. So we camped there and I thought, there's something about this. And I kind of did some research about it. and thought, oh. So that was stored away in my mind. I'd never been to South America before and I'd, been, I'd often thought of it and thought, you know, I don't have time to do the whole thing at the moment. But picking the eye out of the middle of it with the Andes and the Altiplano and the Atacama, I mean, I love deserts. You know, and altitude training, this is the best place to do it pretty much on a bike because you can go the higher, higher than anywhere here on a bike. And so I designed this route, which I'll explain a bit more about, but that's how that came about. What have I missed? Uh, the Baja. So the Baja, again, was something else I knew about ages. So that I kind of pulled all these things together. And Iceland, I'd love to go there in summer, actually. <laughs> Iceland, like, totally under snow. And here it had been raining and then uh, lots of things happened. So it wasn't the best training, but it was still an incredible – well, it was a fun trip in the end. So each of them takes, obviously, funding, but just designing – the logistics, you can't, like, go in by halves. You've got to make sure you've done the research. And so sometimes with these, you know, and I found in 2018 when I did four of them, so that was the Baja, Iceland, Australia, and India, it was kind of like I, I didn't – it was hard to enjoy them enough because I was doing too much because it, it was not just one trip. It was all different ones and, and trying to do – you know, I'm not just doing them. I'm trying to create an education program. I'm trying to – create more with them and and that requires more time than I gave myself I think so learning from that I've stretched the other two out still these are worthwhile standalone expeditions on their own I wanted to make them count as well not just not just doing them for the sake of doing them they're actually they're all special I'd love to talk more about the funding as well and paying for these expeditions because it can't be cheap to do it I mean how are you paying for it is this savings is this income that you're earning is this sponsorship have you We've got a grant. Like, yeah, how are you paying for this? I know everyone has the same problem. It's no easier for me. I'm just fortunate a couple of times that I've managed to get some private sponsors. I don't. I definitely don't have the money myself. And, you know, I try to get, like everyone else does, it's a very competitive world out there. You try to get equipment, not just equipment sponsors, but then to tip in the money. I end up with the equipment quite often, and it's they're just not in a position to, to, to give the funds that I require. Occasionally I get small amounts from some of these people, you know, a couple of grand here and there, but no, they're expensive. And, yeah, there, there are two particular sponsors that, you know, I can't rely on and I don't take them for granted, but they've come up at the right times. You know, I hate asking for money. It's the worst thing. But, you know, if I can do good things with it, that's the only way I can really justify it. So, you know, trying to develop this education program is very difficult to do. If I'm making documentaries – and creating value for sponsors, then hopefully, eventually, the cash might become a little bit easier. But at the moment, I don't know. I, I haven't found anyone, any other adventurer or explorer who, who doesn't have trouble finding funds. It's it's just the perennial problem. I think you have no chance if you don't have an original idea or you know, something that captivates the potential sponsors. You know, I do have a, a track record, which helps. I think it helps. <laughs> But then some people say, well, why do you want money for this? You've already done all these other things. It's like you're greedy. It's like, no, no, I'm not. I'm trying to learn from all my experiences and, and create something good. I can't do – like each journey is it changes you a little bit. It has to become a little bit of 
who you are and that's how the next journey evolves and how you see the world changes a little bit. So the next journey you, you might see it in a slightly different light. So it's all, you know, if I can share that and, and others can learn from that and do it for themselves, that then helps motivate me as well because that's important to me. I mean, one of the things that you've talked about is the education piece and, and building the education piece around the different adventures and challenges. Could you share more about that? So it started off, I worked with the Jump Foundation and we created a couple of units for middle school and, and they're incredible, but we didn't get much uptake because I think teachers are so organized that, you know, to do an eight to 10 week course, um, you know, a couple of hour, couple of lessons a week, they can't fit it in. So what I've done now, I've partnered with um, a woman who's a teach, a lady called Annie Woolard, who's a teach SDGs, so teach sustainable development goals uh, ambassador. And she has been a regular teacher for many, many years, and she's actually moved out of teaching directly to actually teach teachers how to teach the global goals because it's obviously a big thing and, and they need resources to be able to do it and to understand how to fit it across all the di- different disciplines that they teach. So she loves what I'm doing and she knew about me from before. And so she's written for Namibia and then here in, in the Andes, she's um, written 10 lessons so there are 10 lessons that could be used in order, in sequence, or a teacher could just pick out whatever lesson's appropriate for them. And they're all uh, linked to at least one of the global goals. And at the same time, it's the same. It's also about leadership. It's also about geography. It depends. You know, like I know in this one, there's one about sustainable tourism, and I'm about to go to Machu Picchu the day after tomorrow. I mean, that needs to be managed so carefully. So there's the, that side of it. There's, you know, it could be about decent work and you know economic development that kind of you know there's, there's all sorts of sides to it not just you know obviously there's the environment obviously there's poverty you know hunger all of them there's there's, there's 17 of them so you know, she's just done 10 lessons around those goals and um they're really good we just need more uptake so we need teachers to, to pick up pick up on them and it's great if kids like we have some kids in melbourne who some classes who do follow and follow the blogs as well and they're there. They're always there for people to use. It's just getting that word out. To be honest, I need more funding because I need to be able to put the funds into the education program. And I'm always chasing my tail, trying to find funds for that, trying to find funds for the expeditions and trying to find funds for obviously films or anything else that I'm doing. So we keep at it. It's a bit of a juggling act. And with your expeditions, and I know obviously it, it might be a little bit different depending on which expedition and where you are, are you doing them solo? Are you having a team in place? How does that work? Um, they're all different depending on what's required for each one. So, for example, the Baja Divide, I just did, actually did with a, a friend from Melbourne, Chris Pennington, a chap I met, met a little bit earlier. And so it was just back, bikepacking, essentially. So that was just us carrying everything. The polar ones have all been supported because we just need to – we're trying to test things out as well. And I'm going to Antarctica support it as well, so it's, that's fine. But the, obviously that's where, you know, they can really cost. They're all a little bit different. It, mostly now I'm trying to film most of them. And when I need to film them, I just can't do it effectively on my own. I've tried that so many, you know, before. And I just don't come out with anything that's really uh, saleable. I don't really have any editing skills myself. So then, you know, I, I come back with foot, you know, 30 hours of footage or whatever it is and to put something together it's just doesn't get used so then I have to invest and most of the money goes into investing into to filming it to finding people who, who might come with me and you know it's it's different every time this expedition has been the, the trickiest because I did have a a really a very good cinematographer who was going to come with me and he was going to ride a motorbike and I had the motorbike planned and just under three weeks before he pulled out <laughs> I quickly had him to make a, a plan so you know traveling by motorbike I was planning to cycle carrying up to 20 kilos whatever so because the motorbike couldn't carry everything you know that was one of the difficult things with that so it was partially supported I guess but much more expensive because hiring a motorbike is would be cheaper to buy one I think just getting the permits to go or understanding what was to cross various borders where I'm going you know, that's another difficult thing. So he pulled out. I sort of felt that he might be going to, so I started to make a plan. And I already had connections I'd made in Bolivia. And I contacted Chris Pennington, the guy that cycled down the Baja Divide with me. And 
he jumped at the opportunity, but he wanted to just be the filmmaker this time. And so he wasn't going to cycle. So then I had to think of ways to, he needed a vehicle and sure he can drive, but filmmaking and driving in a foreign country like Bolivia would be very difficult. So it's got very complex, but um, then got connected to a, a production company in Peru, a very good one. And he found the fellow who's coming with me through Peru now, uh, Javier, who's just outside. <laughs> so he'll be with me for there. Then he can't drive a hire car across the border in, into uh, Bolivia. So then I have to go myself. So I've got to be unsupported for two days to get to La Paz. And then Chris is flying into there. And then I've got a driver now organized to take him and to support that. And that's great because Javier and also this driver speak English. So we also have an interpreter and we're going to get much more out of the film, out of the story and out of the expedition than I would actually being on my own. And then after going down the border between Bolivia and northern Chile, then down from southwestern Bolivia, that driver will take Chris back to La Paz. He's got to fly to Argentina to Tucumán and then hire a car and then he'll He'll catch me, and in the meantime, I'll be unsupported for probably four or five days, and then he'll meet me. And then this morning, I think I finally sorted out the final bit because he can't take that hire car across the border back into Chile. So, But we found someone who lives not a couple of hundred k's from the border who's going to uh, then come with us when Chris gets there, drive when we get, we get to the border. He'll drive the hire car back, and we've got a. I've hired a mountain guide to go up Oyas del Salado, and he's going to meet us at the border. So that is how complex this expedition is. You know, you want to make a story out of it. You want to know what's going on. What What are you trying to do with the expedition, and what are the circumstances? Risk mitigation is is a massive thing. So you've got to think, how can I do this to give myself the best chance of success, and obviously keeping us safe. You know, there's all sorts of things. So that kind of level of planning has to go into each one, but this time it was crazy because, as I said, I was throwing a bit of a curveball. <laughs> but somehow it sort of come together. Sometimes when you start these things, you, you know, there's times when you could doubt. But if you get the, the momentum, get the ball rolling, then actually you end up finding a way through. And that's what I – you've got to have the nerve to do it sometimes. But you know, I think if I wasn't doing it, you know, I've got the two months off work. I've, I've organised. I'm committed. So um, the education plan was – was written. I had a, Steve Christini's made me another bike, a mountain bike. That's all wheel drive because when I'm going up the final, up Oyas del Salado as high as I can go and three other volcanoes going as high as I can go, it's rough, sandy. I just want to give myself the best chance of getting up there. If I use the fat bike, which would be the ultimate, then that's too slow for the rest of the journey because I'm covering a lot of distance. So it's kind of a a plus size wheel mountain bike with three inch wide tires, but all wheel drive when I need it. So I just switch it on when I need it. So Steve's made that. So he'd already made the bike and this guy pulls out. So I've got all these people already investing time and primed. So I just had to try and find a way through. So I'm exhausted. I think unless you've done something like this to actually know the logistics that have gone in and, and the planning and the preparation and, and everything else to actually make it happen. It's a huge, huge amount of work. So it must be quite a relief when you actually start cycling and do what you've, you know, planned for such a long time. In terms of your fitness and your training, do you have time to train? I mean, how do you maintain your fitness while you're trying to build education programs, you know, earn the money, do the planning and the logistics for, for when you are out doing these challenges? This whole year has already been exceptional because I think you know that I'm a real tennis professional and I played in the Australian Open at the beginning of January for my sport, of which I hurt not just my bad knee but both knees. And I'm going, oh, I can't train for a few weeks with this. I just have to ride it and just do what I can. I had to work full time for the next two weeks. And then on top of that, I'm making a film and all of that had to be pulled together before I went away, it was crazy. I'm just not getting, I haven't had enough sleep for a long time. Everything actually has come together somehow. So the training really has been anti-training the last couple of months. So I'm sort of okay. I mean, I can go out and ride. It's just a matter of riding my, my fitness, getting into the fitness bit as I go. So I haven't, you know, I'm not trying to kill myself the first couple of days, you know, taking it, you know, there's, there's mountains involved, but um you know, one of the things I also did here was uh, borrowed an altitude tent. So I've been had that over my bed at home. So I'm trying to acclimatize before I get here. 
but I only had it for a week, but it still will help, helped a little bit. So yeah, training's always difficult. I, the real tennis stirs my knee up. If I only cycle, my knee gets better. So it's kind of just like when I play the Australian Open, I can't cycle because they don't mix. And when I'm normally working, I'll try and get one longer ride out. You know, I have no trouble riding 100 kilometers straight off, but I'm not trying to go very fast. But I can do that, and then I just work in the gym. I do uh, interval training in the gym, which absolutely keeps me keeps that base level there. And yeah, that's it. Then I just have to trust myself and when I'm here. Um, so it's not what people imagine. I do train intensively and I do do quality training, but I just can't fit it all in. And then I've got here, you, and I wish I would have trained more, but it is what it is. I just have to start tomorrow. <laughs> That's it. And and just ride sensibly. So I, I have to use the gears carefully. I've got a massive range in those gears. And I just have to – probably one of my best skills is understanding the workload that I have to do to that I can repeat over and over and over again. And I guess uh, doing – this journey, you know, it's two months and it's quite, you know, 500 kilometres or so each week in, at altitude because the altitude across the Altiplano is average 3,700 metres. So it's all at altitude. But the long-term strength I get in my body after that, it it's, doesn't, doesn't all go away. It's still there. When it's, So next time I do something, I'm building on that, even though it's, you know, a bit hard for the first couple of weeks to start training again. It's not that far away. So I can tap into it so far i've managed to be been okay at doing that um, but if i don't pace myself when i start if i don't like i can't cycle every single day for example uh, in the baja divide we cycled for 12 days in a row even some were light but my body was going downhill because I, I usually have a break every five days or so at least and i was sick and i had one day off my body caught up just enough and off i went again so yeah the rest time is important in these expeditions i'm not going not, as I say, I'm not racing anyone. I'm I'm trying to feel my way, but I also it has to be done to a schedule. Otherwise, you know, I've only got a certain amount of time to do it. So I've just got to factor all those in and think of the long haul and manage each day as it comes. How do you handle stress and like how do you stop yourself from from burning out? Especially you know reflecting back on 2018 and and those four big very different challenges that you've done and building on everything else you've done you know the, the previous year you know, yeah how are you supporting like your mental health I guess when I'm actually out there on the bike that's the best thing I can do for my mental health it's like it's um you know that's where I I feel most at home but ah, yeah you're right I was totally stressed I could feel my stress levels going up and up and up the few weeks before you know I, I have some good friends in Melbourne and and the social side of the real tennis is is good for my my mind yeah, it's just trying to keep a balance on everything. Um, but just sometimes when everything comes together, like to get here with the filmmaking and all that sort of stuff as well, sometimes you just have to work extra hard and knowing that you don't have to do that for the rest of your life or anything. It's just what it is and you've got to take it in perspective. Yeah, sure, you have to work like ridiculous, ridiculously for a couple of weeks or three weeks or more and then you've weathered the storm and then you can relax a little bit. When I do get out on the bike, even in Melbourne, that's really good for my head. You know, I go home to Western Australia for Christmas. I take my bike and I love it. I actually, I don't normally get to do that. I go for just a nice 50K ride or 30 or 60K ride every day. And I wish I could do that all the time, but I just don't have the time to do that. Yeah, it's just finding a balance. And, you know, I don't make enough time for myself to read which I should do or whatever I I'm also end up doing is planning the next expedition <laughs> but it's, yeah it's good to have good friends around as well. What are your plans for the rest of 2020? It depends whether I find the funding for Antarctica but there is still quite a lot on so this this expedition is two months get back just at the end of April and then in the middle of so from the 21st of July to the 18th of August I'm doing an Australian and New Zealand tour of the film that we're making about the coast which is called diamonds in the sand 80 minute feature doc and i'm doing a presentation with uh, adventure entertainment so a presentation tour with adventure entertainment so i'm presenting for say 25 minutes first then we show the film and then there'll be a q a and basically i've got two of those uh, each week so for the first week i think is brisbane and melbourne and and each of these places i'm doing um 
a school session and also a, a, an evening session. We're hoping we're going to get lots of people coming along. Uh, that's got July and August fixed, but then there's just a lot of all the promotion and everything that has to go into it beforehand. There's two and a half months from when I get back before the first event. So, you know, there'll be time, hopefully, you know, I'll probably be writing magazine articles and doing other stuff as well as working. <laughs> so that's it really. So, um, and I'm always trying to find funding for Antarctica. So when I see an opportunity, I'm, I put a lot of effort into putting a proposal together. So there isn't much time for anything else. <laughs> uh, e- even if I don't go to Antarctica this year, there'll, there'll be a lot of build up. Like last year I was working, in the second half of last year I was working really hard to try to find the sponsors for Antarctica then, you know, so that's when it has to happen. It's just not like, oh, let's plan this and three months later you're doing it. It takes much more. <laughs> you know, for, for me, I have to be able to have clear objectives for each each journey and, and that can be quite sort of deep for me as, as well. Is it also true now, have you got your doctorate or have you got like an honorary doctor degree? Is that Has that also happened over the past couple of years? Oh, uh, yeah, that is well, 2016 I got that. Um, so honorary doctor of education from the University of Western Australia. When I was, when I got that letter, I couldn't believe it. I read it about 20 times and I phoned my parents going, guess what? <laughs> yeah, so then I had to do the graduation address at University of Western Australia and receive the doctorate. So it was a bit of a high point of my life once I got through the graduation address bit. <laughs> yeah, no, that was um, a, a great honour. I was going to say massive congratulations. I should, I should be calling you Dr. Kate Leeming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't have to, it's fine. So Kate, I'd love for you to share your final words of advice for other women out there who want to live a more adventurous life, who want to explore more, they want to go on expeditions. What advice would you have for them? Uh, look, I mean, a lot of people are af- afraid to take the first steps. And I just think you've got to, and it doesn't have to be what I'm doing. You can you can just start from. Everyone's got to start from somewhere. So it's really finding what you like, and it's having a go. And it doesn't matter if you mess it up; it's fine. Just make sure you're safe. So many people look at me and think everything you're doing is really dangerous, but I don't think it is because it's it's just you could have the same issues at home. Everything can be dangerous if you think it's going to be. You've got to take the be you know, bold enough to take the first steps and and you'll suddenly it'll be liberating really I think the news that you see everything's built around fear pretty much nature and that's what you hear every day around you and the only way to break that is to create your own good news really to go out and see things and do things and make a difference yourself and it's all possible uh, it's just working out what you can do and understanding you might sort of find new layers of potential once you take those first steps. So, you know, I always like to tell the kids, you know, explore to find your – to discover your own passion. But then I think if you do that, then you can take – you know, you're in a position to take the next step and the next step, and that will change you a little bit and you'll see the world differently. Just taking those first steps is really important. And I love what you've just said, and it's a, a brilliant way to end, which is explore to discover your own passion – absolutely fantastic but Kate best of luck with your South American challenge 3,500 kilometers over the next 56 days starting from Cusco in Peru and heading down to the world's highest volcano in Chile it's you know an absolutely incredible journey and just yeah best of luck have an amazing time and it'll be fantastic to catch up with you after you've done um, after you've done this expedition It'd be fantastic. You can follow my blogs if you go to my website, which is breakingthecycle.education. If you sign up to the newsletter, you'll get the blogs by email. And there's a blog page there as well. And there's all the expeditions that I've done on there pretty much. Yeah, you can see it all there. Oh, fantastic. And what I'll do is I'll make sure I put the links to breakingthecycle.education on in the show notes so that people can come and follow along with your latest adventure and challenge. But thank you so much for coming back on the Tough Girl Podcast Extra and sharing more about what you've been up to over the past couple of years. It's been absolutely awe-inspiring. Thanks, Sarah. It's been fun. Hey, 
Hey Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Kate. What an absolute legend. I always think it's fascinating to be able to go back to see what the women are have been up to since we last spoke to them. And so I'm, I'm finding sort of doing Tough Girl Extra absolutely fascinating. Now, if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you obviously know it's Sarah speaking. But if you're brand new, I'd love to just introduce myself. So my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast. I'll share a little bit more information about me and Tough Girl challenges and just do a few little, a little shout outs of things which I think will be quite sort of interesting just to make you aware of um, you know what's going on. So Tough Girl Challenges was started in 2014 as a way of motivating and inspiring women and girls. My mission is to increase the amount of female role models in the media and um, it's got a sort of a focus on women who do adventure and undertake big physical challenges. So I am the host of the award-winning Tough Girl podcast where I do interview these inspirational female explorers, adventurers, athletes and everyday women who've overcome great challenges. The Tough Girl podcast has now passed over a million downloads which is incredible. We're listened to in 174 countries around the world but not only do I interview these women and sort of you know talk and talk (laughs) a lot um, about what they've done and what they've achieved but I also sort of walk the walk as such so I like to get out there as well and to challenge myself and also to document that and share that journey with you so I've completed the Marathon de Saabs which I did in April 2016 running six marathons in six days across the Sahara Desert in 2017 I threw hiked the Appalachian Trail solo and unsupported. That was 2,190 miles, which I did in 100 days, which I've also daily vlogged. So you can check that out on your YouTube channel. 2018, I completed my master's in women and gender studies from Lancaster University. I wrote my 20,000 word dissertation focusing on women, adventure and fear. I then went off and cycled 4,000 kilometers from Vancouver, Canada, by the Pacific Coast Highway down to Cabo San Lucas in Mexico. In 2019, I became a qualified yoga instructor and a personal trainer. And I've also started to do um, sort of some more shorter walks. So um, in September 2019, I walked the Camino Portuguese, 675 kilometers from Lisbon in Portugal to Santiago de Copon, <laughs> de Copos. <laughs> I can't even say it. Santiago de Compostela. Compostela. I obviously am rubbish at languages and can't speak French or Spanish. Um, but I actually did that in collaboration with Cicerone, an incredible guidebook company who sponsored quite a few of my hikes now and sponsored uh, the video content. So you, you can also follow along with those journeys on Instagram. My handle is at Tough Girl Challenges and the hashtag is Challenge with Cicerone. So I've done um, some great hikes with them. I've got some awesome hikes planned with them in the coming year. So this year so far, I've walked the Overland Track over in Tasmania which is an 80 kilometer trail, which starts in Ronnie Creek in Cradle Valley and ends at, ends at Cynthia Bay on Lake St. Clair, which is, has to be one of the most beautiful hikes um, that I've done. But Cicerone was um, launched a new guidebook and that came out on the 15th of February in 2020. So I was over there, you know, basically documenting my journey on the Overland Track and helping them to promote their, their new guidebook. So, you know, incredible opportunity. I've got a future opportunities coming up with them later on the year, which I will be sharing. So make sure you are following along on the different social media channels but I just want to talk briefly about the podcast Um, so one of the reasons that I'm able to spend my time editing and interviewing and promoting on social media is due to the support of 265 incredible women and men around the world who believe in my mission to pay it forward, who believe in the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media. And I just want to say a massive thank you to Deborah Holt, to Ellen Piercy, to Katja Lunaire, Sarah Bright, Tara Geiger and Zoe Langley Watham. I really do massively appreciate your financial support every single month. Um, it's it means so much to me knowing that you believe in the mission. And all I'd like to ask you is just these couple of questions. If you answer yes, then I'd love for you to think about becoming a patron. Have you been motivated by the Tough Girl podcast? Have you been inspired by the Tough Girl podcast? Have you made a change in your life because of the Tough Girl podcast? If you have and it has added value to your life, think how much value it could add to other women and men around the world and one of the best ways that you can do that is by signing up as a patron you can sign up from two dollars a month you can sign up from five dollars a month that would be my preference five dollars a month would be absolutely incredible because the more women and men I get supporting me every single month, um, the more work that I can do in this space, the more opportunities that I can take advantage of. And so that I can increase and publicize these incredible women who are doing these phenomenal challenges. There's, there's probably over about 300 interviews now, over 300 hours of content. And that's just from the podcast. You know, the regular episodes come out every Tuesday at 7am UK time. And the Tough Girl Extra episodes such as this one come out on a Thursday at 7am UK time. So I'm really trying very hard at the moment to make sure there's a lot of amazing content coming out. So 
For example, with Tough Girl Extra, we've caught up with Jackie Hill Murphy, who shared more about her expedition to travel the length of the Amazon River and the Lost Inca Trail. We've caught up with Mimi Anderson, an endurance athlete, a multiple world record holder running across America. She shares more about dealing with failure, overcoming fears and getting into swimming and biking. That's it's quite an emotional episode, actually. Um, we caught up with Catherine Bertie to see what's been happening in her world. Um, she's an athlete and advocate for equality in women's sports. She actually suffered... Um, quite or had quite a bad biking industry a uh, biking industry a uh, bike accident bike injury and ended up having sort of a traumatic brain injury and so what's you know what's gone on for her since then we've caught up with Emily Penn an ocean advocate and skipper working on solving the plastic pollution crisis Shona McPherson we spoke to Shona at the very sort of beginning of 2019 as she shared more about her hike on the Pacific Crest Trail hiking 2,650 miles Sobo from Canada to Mexico so at the end of December in 2019 we caught up with Shona to find out how that how that hike went so there's incredible episodes of amazing women and I'm just so grateful to every single one of you who listens to the Tough Girl podcast who supports the Tough Girl podcast whether that is sponsorship through Patreon or whether that is through sharing or telling your friends because it all makes a massive difference but have an you know have an incredible day wherever you are whatever you are doing give it your all give it 110 percent. get after it you've got one life and you've got to live it you've got to live your dreams you've got to take the first step so do that today don't wait don't delay do it now do it right now but make sure you hit that subscribe button i'll be back with you next tuesday for another awesome episode of the tough girl podcast all right lots of love and i'll speak to you soon bye <laughs>